In part one, I gave an overview of the music industry and how record contracts work. Today, we'll be applying what was taught to an artist who was hot back in 2011 and still owes her record label $800,000. And near the end, I'm gonna unveil someone who I think is running an impressive business as an independent artist and is making significantly more money doing so. Hint. You've likely never heard of this Harvard-educated artist. Krayshawn is an artist that blew up a decade ago. She still maintains a following of nearly 300,000 on YouTube, over half a million on Twitter, and over 300,000 on Instagram. She released music recently, but it was something she tweeted that caught my attention and could become a good anecdote to my first video about the music industry. For those of you who watched part one, you should have a good understanding of why she might be in debt to Sony for $800,000. The reason why I find this story interesting is that Krayshawn was hot for a minute and had actual hits. She has two songs on her YouTube that have reached 82 million views combined, and her YouTube as a whole has garnered 143 million views. Regardless of what you think about her music, in a lot of ways, she reached levels of success that most artists aren't able to attain. When her most popular song, Gucci, Gucci was playing everywhere, Sony very quickly signed her to a $1 million record contract. Krayshawn was recently in an interview on the Mask Gorilla podcast and gave great insights into the record business that I felt would make for a great educational video on how the business works. Yeah. Signs the million dollar deal, yeah, yeah. It was either shortly after or whenever like you did the interview and you were like, yeah, people think I just have a million dollars in my bank account, but that's not how this whole thing works. No, um, no, I got a portion of it. I definitely had it. When I put that check in my bank account, I had, I think I had like $300 in my bank account. And then I just put in like a $300,000 check. We don't know the exact details of the record contract, but my guess is that it was a three album contract and she received roughly one third of the money from the contract for each album as an advance. Now class, what did we learn about record advances in part one? The money is recoupable, meaning she was provided 300,000 to complete the album, but she still owed the money back to the label. And even worse, the advance is meant to serve as a way for the artist to pay for their expenses to make the album. You sign your deal, you get dropped, you mm -hmm. still get to keep the money they already gave you. They probably don't fulfill. Like, did you ever see yeah. the full million? Or it's like, no, here's no, the advance no. for the first album. That was like $300,000. Yeah. yeah. But you're floating off of that for the next few years, right? Yeah. And I'm sure you're making money some doing other stuff. Spent a lot of it. Artist signs a million dollar record deal. They are a millionaire. That's not how it is. She only receives the million dollars if she fulfills whatever requirement is in the contract, which sometimes won't happen due to the label not releasing albums or an artist flopping and not getting a second chance. And the advance is money for the artist to live off of for what might be multiple years. Because any time we did a tour or like anything like that that came out of like my money mm -hmm. so like right everyone's hotels everyone's flights everyone's but the bus food all that comes out of my money so i mean by the time it was all over i wasn't even close to 300k but i was it was enough if you follow certain genres of music where artists get signed and then wear their wealth or buy expensive cars, it's very important that you understand this principle. Just because an artist signs a million dollar deal does not mean they have any money. Krayshawn supported her team and paid for all of the expenses that came with making the album. It would be amazing to see the balance sheet of all the money spent. And she's a solo act. Imagine if this was a band of three or four people, the money would be split even more. What's challenging for new artists that finally get the record deal and only have $300 in their bank account is that they don't have the habits and knowledge of personal finance to be able to handle that much money hit their bank account all at once. It's very easy to spend it when it's all in your bank account and you don't understand what recoupable means. In hip hop and rap, you'll see artists go out and buy custom jewelry, exotic cars, and living a lavish lifestyle all on Instagram. And you may think they're ballin', but really they're just spending the label's money. This next segment is why so many artists today have a difficult time making any money as a major label artist. When you say he wrote it, do you mean he just wrote the hook and you filled in the verses or he wrote the no, entire song? No, he wrote the whole thing. Oh. I think I think the only thing I did at that time was like switch some things out that mm -hmm. like made more sense or like, you know, put a little bit more of like a female perspective on it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, like he, yeah, he sent it to me. He was like, yo, you should do this. 
I'm like, okay. <laughs> What's hard to see behind the scenes with your favorite artists is who is actually producing the music. Many artists and music rely on a team of people to make their music. If an artist didn't write their own music, why should they get a huge cut of the profits? They're essentially just a performer in the face of the production. If your favorite artist doesn't play any instruments or write their own music, it's likely that they receive a very small royalty check from the income generated by their music. You're saying a song that you wrote know. completely by yourself, you still got no, less percentage. because, you know, then. anybody who walks in a studio gets uh, a percent somehow, you know? Right, yeah. I'll be writing a song, they're like, you should say they are instead of there. And then next thing you know, they have a percentage on your record. You're like, what? Like... I don't know how prevalent this is, but for those of you who are in the music industry, I would love to hear about your experience on how many mouths are getting fed. I'm doing the album and like the label's really pushing this agenda of like being pop because I think what happened was they just couldn't figure out how to market what Gucci Gucci was into like record sales. Sure. They're like, let's, let's save this and like turn her into Katy Perry. What I found really interesting in this next interview clip, she says, How do you feel about signing this deal with Columbia? Uh, well, I feel it. like it's a good move. They're like, they're like, we want you to do whatever you want to do, whatever you're doing and working with, like keep working with them. The label signed her wanting to be herself, but then tried to control her into becoming a pop star like Katy Perry, which she certainly was not. This practice seems to be common with many major label artists. Let's look at this from the label's perspective. Their sole purpose is growing an artist into a profitable business, and the easiest way to do that is to appeal to the widest audience as they can. One of the major themes of the movie A Star Is Born is Bradley Cooper's character trying to keep Lady Gaga's character from becoming another manufactured pop star for the label and losing what made her special. There's always going to be tension between artists and record executives because of how different their jobs are. Artists want to make music and executives want to make money. Unfortunately, sometimes executives want a specific sound or specific image for an artist that doesn't align with what the artist wants for themselves. The root cause of tension between artists and record labels revolve around two concepts. One, the artist feels like their record contract isn't fair and that the label is taking too much of the profit. Or two, creative control of the music and the artist's ability to have free reign over their sound and image. Here, Lupe Fiasco details a conversation he had with Lior Cohen, formerly chairman and CEO of Warner Music Group, where he likened the setup to the mob cartel after Cohen threatened to not promote Lupe's albums if he didn't fall in line. He was an accountant for Neo and Brian McKnight, too. But he was stealing everyone's money. Oh, really? Yeah. And Is that like in the news? There's Yeah, he went uh -huh. to jail. Oh. He's in jail right now. To pay your the taxes, taxes for the year. Because when you get paid by a record label, you're an independent contractor, and they don't take taxes out of what they give you. So mm -hmm. it's your responsibility to pay the government, yeah. and you hire an accountant, and mm -hmm. you think he's doing it. So you're giving him the money that you think is going. To pay that. But he never He's filed. pocketing it. This is my worst nightmare. He never even filed for all Holy those years. Shit. And um, so, yeah, I owed $350,000 in taxes. So they wiped my bank account to zero. What's also unfortunate about the entertainment industry is that there are greedy scumbags who con athletes and artists out of their money. There's no easier target for a scammer than someone who just signed a contract that took them from being broke to having a lot of money in their bank account in one day. According to this MTV article, her Something About Cray album sold 3,900 units in the first week of release. And in this excellent article written by Mark Tavern, only 17,000 physical, and digital albums have been sold to date as pure sales. Remember that the record label received their cut from album sales first. The royalties owed to Krayshawn only amounted to roughly $100,000. Because the album flopped, the label cut off their investment in her and Krayshawn never released another album. I've noticed that record labels will shelve albums and no longer promote you if they don't believe you can become a star that brings in the dough. You ultimately become a slave to your contract since the label isn't going to release another album of yours and you're unable to go record for any other labels. I'm going to include the link to a really well-written article in the description below titled What It's Like When a Label Won't Release Your Album on BuzzFeed, which highlights all of the ways an artist can get shelved. 
I have two final thoughts. One, the labels take on ridiculous financial risk. They signed Creation to a million dollar deal, hoping she could turn her fame from Gucci Gucci into a profitable career. They risked $1 million in access to their entire billion dollar system in hopes that they could make a profit on her music. But she only sold 3,900 copies in the first week. They only recruit probably 40,000 off a $300,000 advance, plus marketing and salary dollars. The labels act the way they do, because they need to profit, and they mostly profit off of the one or two home runs on the roster that help pay for all of the other artists who lose money. Two, I want to highlight an artist who I highly respect who is making a great career as an independent. Ryan Leslie is a Harvard graduate and was once seen as an up-and-coming star for a major label. He is most known for his Grammy-nominated album in 2011, Transition. Ryan is incredibly talented as he conducts and produces his own music. He was one of the first artist to provide a glimpse into the life as a musician on his YouTube channel where he would vlog about his experiences and behind the scenes look at producing his music. He is also known for producing the hit track Me and You by Cassie who he eventually dated. When Ryan got dropped from his major label he decided to make music on his own terms. And I felt like living in a land of technology now and innovation and entrepreneurship I should actually have a direct contact with all my fans. To the consumer, correct. Right. So I gave my number out. So I, I gave my number out 2013. You're the first and... crazy person to do that. I'm giving my number out, but you gave your real number out. Yeah, well, I gave my real number out. And that... Similar to an email marketer, Ryan captures fans' emails and allows them to purchase his albums, concert tickets, and merchandise directly through his Renegades Club membership. This allows him to communicate directly with his fans in a semi-personal automated messaging system. But what this also allows is access to data on where your fans are located and how much they spend with you. This gives Ryan and his team the ability to understand where he should hold concerts and who he should send personalized messages to while on stage. Connect with the people who really cared about my music mm -hmm. and uh, they paid me directly. I didn't have to wait for streaming services, et cetera. Everything was just direct. And so I can now tour based on just who I know every single person that actually bought my record. Right. Written in this Pando article, David Holmes writes, check this out. Leslie's first album released on Motown in 2008 sold 180,000 copies, but the royalties Leslie received from those sales did not cover the $100,000 advance he received to produce it. His new self-distributed album, however, has only sold 12,000 copies, less than one-tenth the sales of his Motown debut, and yet Leslie has received around 160 grand in revenue off album sales alone. When merchandise sales and concert tickets purchased through his site are taken into account, Leslie has made over $400,000 since going independent. Mm -hmm. So when I actually sold my record directly, no middlemen, I sold my tickets directly, no middlemen, 15,000 records times $10, that's 150,000 mm -hmm. and went straight to my pocket. Hopefully by now you can start understanding what artists mean when they talk about their record deals. Because Ryan produces and writes his own music, he was able to make money on the publishing side, so he did fine, but most artists don't write, produce, and record their music. The beauty of actually knowing every single person who bought my record means mm -hmm. that when I went on tour, you know I could send can a text go. to them. I'm in your city. Right, I'm mm -hmm. in your city. I'm really bummed because this interview is unfortunately copyrighted, so I had to remove some really important clips after I completed making the video. Ryan goes in detail about his previous record deal and the numbers behind his current music business. If you're interested in this topic, I would highly recommend listening to this interview that Ryan did with The Breakfast Club. I really enjoyed the comments from part one, which made me realize that this could be a multi-part series. If there's anything you feel I have missed or want me to discuss, let me know as I'd love to make a part three. Or if you're one of the handful of people watching this who have a legitimate experience in this business, please email me, reach out to me, we'll discuss on a Zoom chat for part three. Thank you so much for watching.